Hello, and welcome to Tipsy Tolstoy, Russian Literature for the Inebriated. I'm Matt Garasimovich, a PhD student in Russian Lit. This week, sold something for the first time on Facebook Marketplace and didn't even get a little bit murdered. (laughs) And I'm Cameron Lalana. This week was the first time I've gotten to speak to my friends from high school in a while, so I played Minecraft with them. And apparently starting a revivalist faction of the ALF in order to build a cannon with which to shell my friend's industrial farming operation is considered griefing, and I'm not allowed back on the server. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Sounds like you're rekindling that friendship very well. (laughs) (laughs) This is a podcast where me and my good pal Cameron get to unwind from our week with some Russian literature and a drink or two. This week, we're going to be continuing our Summer of Anna Karenina series with the second part of Leo Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. We've got a lot more goodies and whatnot in our Discord, so go ahead and check that out in the show notes or on our website for a link to join. Uh, And, you know, find out a little bit more about our Summer of Anna Karenina action. And if you're interested in helping keep the show running, take a look at patreon.com slash tipsytolstoy. We have a lot of fun Patreon-only content and rewards, and it really helps the show out because this is a lot of work to produce. Uh, If you're not interested in Patreon, but you would prefer to support us in a more, well, free way, you can leave us a nice review on Apple Podcasts or sign up for our email list on our website. Yes, thank you for all the updates. But before we get into the reading, Matt, what are you drinking today? I'm drinking what is slowly becoming my standard on this show, and that's, that's a Jack and Coke for me. You're gonna have to start varying the vodka or the the jack, so that becomes your variation here. Yeah, it's well. It, it speaking of a lot of work to produce the show, I just feel like the oh, the one thing that I always forget or don't have time to do is just run out to grab beer. <laughs> uh, and and I feel bad because I I want to do like a different craft beer each week, but then they're never you know they're always sold in packs of four. So I'm like, all right, it's mm. a lot of money each week that I'm spending <laughs> on beer. <laughs> And that's why you should spend money on us on Patreon so we can afford our drinking habit. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you drinking this week? Uh, I am drinking a white yuzu ale from Kyoto Beer, uh, which is a, a, a line from the Kizakura Brewery based in, uh, as you might guess, Kyoto. Um, I'm a big fan of white ales. And I, I was going to say, like, I love Japanese beer, but I just love beer. But I gotta say Japanese beer is it's just some of the best and this is a man of culture I mean <laughs> you know I love Japanese beer I love white ales I like citrus I like fruit this is perfect uh, 10 out of 10 do you recommend it I would recommend it if you can find it if, if your if your local corner store imports beer from Japan and it's not Orion although there's nothing wrong with the good old Orion beer you should get it <laughs> I'll give it a look excellent okay so Welcome back to week two, or uh, depending on how you're looking at it, week three of our Anna Karenina series. Just like before, we're going to be kicking it off with just pure summary because, oh my God, so many things happen in this book. We're just yeah. going to cover that and then start going over some of the particulars of it. If you watch the movies a couple episodes back, you're still going to be in pretty familiar territory. Uh, a lot of this is covered in the movies, but in much greater detail. Well, except for the most fun girls weekend ever. Yeah, except for that part. Well, maybe fun. Most fun girls weekend with a moral lesson ever. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so we rejoin our cast. I'm not exactly certain how much longer later. It's towards the end of winter. So this is sometime later. We rejoin the Shrabatsky family. And at this point, Kitty is sick, or at least her family believes her to be sick. So they're getting doctors in and... Uh, a celebrated doctor who is really not all that smart, but he is celebrated, is brought in in order to examine her. And he carries out a very invasive examination. And, you know, her father and her mother are all debating over what's going on. And the celebrated doctor is telling her that she's got tuberculosis. And through it all, Kitty's like, you idiots, I'm not sick. I'm just heartbroken. <laughs> and only her dad, the prince, seems to notice that. Everyone else is like, you probably got TB. Uh, you should drink more spring water. Nailed it. Fixed. <laughs> Fixed it. This is the era still when I think people weren't really uh, sold on doctors. And, you know, you can see why. <laughs> I honestly, just rubbing vodka on, like, her chest would probably have done more <laughs> for her. Not least of all, because, like, slight intoxication might have, all does help with heartbreak, I'm told. <laughs> I just feel like considering how dehydrated people are drinking, like advising them to drink water probably wasn't the worst diagnosis either. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be the worst diagnosis for me either, no. no. Um, <laughs> so at the end of that, they decide, we're going to go abroad. That's what's going to solve your TB. Again, 
Not really certain about the medicine, but, you know, a trip abroad is a trip abroad. After that, Dr. leaves, Dolly arrives, and she sees her family, and they're not super friendly to Dolly. Uh, Dolly talks with Kitty, and, and we find out that Dolly is really not having a good time. In the months since she reconciled with her husband, Steva, she has basically just been facing humiliation after humiliation. She suspects that he's still carrying on other liaisons, for lack of a better word. Her kids are sick. She's just feeling awful, and she's feeling jealous, and... She speaks with Kitty, and she tries to help Kitty get over Kitty's heartbreak over the Vronsky situation, and Kitty is not really having it. She kind of lashes out at Dolly and uh, on the basis of her crumbling, well, crumbled marriage. After a brief moment of, you know, awkwardness, as you do when you, you just go for the throat verbally with your sibling. <laughs> just two sisters hanging out. <laughs> just two sisters taunting each, other, taunting each other over their heartbreak. You know, sibling stuff. Just sibling stuff. After that, they kind of begin to make up and, and say, you know, I, both of them are telling each other how miserable they feel. And, and they're like, you know, what makes us feel good hanging around your kids? That makes us not think about the terrifying existential things we're facing. So Kitty convinces her parents to let her go home with Dolly and help Dolly take care of her kids who've got scarlet fever. Oops. <laughs> Following this, we go ahead and jump over to the, the better city of, the, of this tale of two cities, <laughs> Petersburg where we learn a little bit about the so-called sets of Petersburg society, where, of course, everyone knows everyone, but people tend towards certain groups, which they call sets. And we go over the various sets that uh, Anna Karenina is involved with. After her visit to Moscow, she begins to tend more towards the circle, which is, is centered around her cousin's wife, Countess, excuse me, Princess Betty Tverskaya. Now, of course, uh, Betty, uh, her cousin, is also Vronsky, who may have had some things to do with this because oftentimes when Anna goes to Betty's events, Vronsky shows up. Interestingly, shockingly, unexpectedly, perhaps. So in this particular night, we join Betsy as she's actually hanging out with Vronsky at a theater, and they're discussing, kind of discussing around Vronsky's liaisons with Anna, and which is kind of cut off eventually by Vronsky saying, I need to go, I'm actually, I'm mediating for some people. And he explains that he's mediating for these two officers who were drinking and went home and happened to see this, I would say, beautiful woman. But all they really say is that they saw her lips and her exquisite little feet. So I don't know what to make of that. But they decide to follow her home, write her a letter, and then go knock on her door, to which her husband answers and receives the letter from the two and, and gets not not super happy with it. So he demands some kind of restitution and now Vronsky is trying to mediate between the husband and these two officers since the government clerk is thinking maybe we should make something of this. You know, you, your regiment's been having a lot of issues lately, but... Just Russian military boy things, you know. <laughs> just just things that happen when you don't have sensitivity trait. Well, I'm not certain that solves that one, but yeah, just, just Russian military things. So he goes off to go deal with that, and we, we join Betsy's party lady later after the, the theater which is initially just her and her friends, and they are all discussing Anna. And there, there are a variety of reactions to Anna, and even, even Anna's friends kind of are getting on her about her involvement with Vronsky. And, and Betsy actually defends Anna, and, and she kind of says, we really can't judge her. How can she help it if they're all in love with her and follow her about like shadows? If no one follows us about like a shadow, there's no proof that we have any right to blame her. Cameron, would you say... That all life, perhaps, is made up out of light and shadow. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think what? I think that's definitely what Princess Betty is implying here. Betsy, fuck. Poor Betty and or Betsy. Well, the, the names are, you're only going to get them right like half the time. So like when you go back to edit it, it's just going to be like, you're going to have to leave them all in and just hope it blends. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps life is like light and shadow. Just a little bit of both. Just a little bit. But also Shadow are now, in this case, men, I think. So what is life without life, lights, and, and also men, I guess? Yeah, there's some. So there, I think there's some good Shadow puns in, in this book. Uh, so we keep going. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, it's fun fun that everyone's kind of on her side a little bit for, for now. <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> so there's some foreshadowing for you that you might not entirely pick up on. <laughs> it was subtle. <laughs> so as they're having this conversation... Uh, Anna stops by, and she begins to chat with them. And of course, not long after Anna's arrival, 
Vronsky arrives, and they go off to the side to, to chat a little bit. This is nothing really unusual until Karenin himself arrives, and he, you know, like the man he is, immediately just goes to the center of the room and begins chatting with Betsy about... Light and shadow. <laughs> yeah, like... <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> He discusses he discusses bread rolls with <laughs> Betsy, and um, doesn't really not doesn't really pay much attention to Anna for most of the evening. So you've kind of got this, you've got Corinne off to one side, Anna off to the other. Everyone's kind of looking back and forth and being like, oh, "Isn't this scandalous?" But actually, Corinne doesn't notice anything the whole time. He's really just hanging out, chatting about law, basically. And when he goes to leave, he says, "You know, are you to come home, Anna?" And she says, "No, I'm I'm gonna stay for supper." And he takes off. When he arrives home, he, he thinks that he really hadn't seen anything improper about that series of events that seemed normal. Of course, now his wife is chatting with someone. That's not that unusual. That happens all the time, literally all day long. But everyone else seems to have felt that something was improper about that. So maybe there was. He waits up and he waits until quite late in the evening, well after one o'clock, I believe. And, and he's kind of making a plan for how he's going to not exactly confront his wife, but remind her that... She is in a, a union greater than one of man. She's in a union of God with him, and they also have a certain face to keep on in, in, in public society. But of course, jealousy is beneath them, so he's really not going to bring that into it. And when she finally arrives home, he approaches her with that, and Anna just does not want to deal with it. She is really just kind of taking off her jewelry and, and looking over at him as if, she really doesn't understand, of course, although of course she does. The main way she chooses to deal with that, or she knows how to deal with that in this case, is that she just kind of is like, I don't really know what you're talking about. I'm just, I was just chatting. Do you not like it when I, you know, just chat with people? Eventually she is just like, I'm, I'm so tired. It's like, let's go to bed. And they go and they lie down and, and they just lay there in silence, awake, uncertain of what to do. Karenin kind of begins to, to, to feel the divide that... Previously, up to that point, he always felt that he knew Anna, and he knew what was going on, and now there's there's just a divide there, and he feels that something is different. Not unfairly. In the following months, and up to a year later, their life continues on, and, and Karenin senses that something is different, and he begins to treat her slightly, slightly differently, but for all intents and purposes, everything is the same. And this is about the point when we finally come to the, the confirmation that not only are Anna and Vronsky playing about having an affair, but they are actively engaging in an affair. And we join them in a, in a scene where they're both sitting on a couch and, and kissing each other, and, and Anna tells Vronsky that all is over. I have nothing but you. Remember that. Following that, she begins to live a life where she kind of wants to be able to talk about that, but she really can't because there's just no moment of peace that comes to her. And that is how she carries on for the foreseeable future. In the middle of all this, uh, what we'll call it intrigue, we go back to Levin and his enthralling farm adventures finally it was getting a little boring i thought so i wanted some like steamy farm action you know i was really looking forward to 15 straight pages of him critiquing the way the peasants planted their yes. nobody wants <laughs> sex we want peasant farming critiques <laughs> yeah that sounds like a joke but that's basically what happens for the next couple of chapters <laughs> levin returns home initially feeling awful over his rejection but in the coming months as the the time turns to spring, he feels himself being taken over by his books, by chatting with his housekeeper, Agafia Mikhailovna, and, and he just feels enthralled by this new world of planting crops. Yes. <laughs> and we go through the next couple of chapters, which are basically <laughs> him being frustrated because although he's got so many innovations and ideas for how they could overhaul their process of storing and planting crops, they don't really, no one really listens to him, including the guy he hired to make sure people listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> So we, we follow him around for the next couple of chapters, riding around his, his area on a horse, just being mad at people not doing things the correct way. Just well, reining in his anger and trying to show them the correct way, but no one listens to him. King. King. <laughs> this continues until finally, after many months, Steva shows up. And as they had promised each other somewhere between some number of months to a year ago, they finally hang out for a couple of days. They go shooting. They, they enjoy their time. Steva sells his wife's forests to a, a merchant of Pierre Ryabinin, uh, who is really ripping Steva off, and Levin really is trying to tell him that, but Steva doesn't really want to create problems with Ryabinin, so he just goes and sells the property to him anyway, even though he is like 
pretty certain that Levin's probably right, but he's like, I already made the deal, so what can I do? I'm helpless at this point. It's fine. It's a boys weekend anyways. It's a weekend <laughs> for the boys. They're going to relax in nature by shooting some birds. The perfect way to enjoy nature, probably. <laughs> yeah. Hot boy summer, killing things and <laughs> losing money. Yes, exactly. That's it. <laughs> All right, fair enough. We got boys trip on one plot line, girls trip on the other one, and Anna's life slowly falling apart on the third. <laughs> That's actually a shockingly accurate summary of this part of the book. That's part two. Don't even you don't even need spark notes. You don't even need to read the book. We got you. That's it. <laughs> yeah, through this, Levin finally learns of Kitty's illness, and he feels bad, but he also feels kind of good about it, which. <laughs> Uh, I, I would like to say he doesn't feel kind of good because she turned him down, but that's that's not subtext. That's actual text that he feels kind of good about it because <laughs> she turned him down. <laughs> I do enjoy the moral complexity of everyone being kind of a piece of shit in this book. Yeah. Well, Anna's not. She's, yeah. She may have done things wrong, but I would say she's not. Not like not like Lev Levin so far. Sorry, not Lev. Well, she's gaslit her sister-in-law into staying into a terrible marriage, cheated on her husband, and a few other small thing <laughs> okay yeah that one's pretty bad but uh so everyone's kind of a dick except for the perfect character who we'll be meeting soon <laughs> is it the dog <laughs> well okay laska's the other perfect character <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> so following all this we join vronsky as he gets ready to race um and, and he, he has three great loves in life the first love is anna the second love is his regiment and the third love is is horses so he, he's getting ready to race uh, at uh, Krasnaya Sela, and in this day, he's getting pumped up. His, horses, his horse, Frufu, uh, is a little bit jittery, but he's still feeling good about it. Everyone's kind of clapping on the back and saying, You're, you basically got this in the bag. You've got maybe one guy who is going to be competition, but you, you've got this. You can do it. Feeling good about this, he goes, Vronsky goes off to Petergolf to go see Anna, where Anna tells him that she is pregnant, and he is like, Cool. You should leave your husband. And she's like, I can't because I've got my son. And they kind of go back and forth on that for a while until she kind of is like, okay, well, we'll, we'll figure something out. Gronsky goes back to the horse race, begins to race, and he's doing great until he, he lands wrong on his horse after a jump and he breaks Fru-Fru's back. Through this all, Anna has been watching Fronsky just laser focused. And to the extent that her husband has like clearly been noticing, but she does not care anymore. And at first, he, he's trying to figure out who she's staring at. But as he, she follows him and he sees many riders falling off and even one guy dying in this race, she does not care until Vronsky falls, at which point she kind of leaps up and is pacing about. And he's like, OK, so this is I see. And he kind of says, OK, let's let's go. And after some uh, in inducements, he, he gets her to leave with him and they get in a carriage. And he's like, hey, you know, that was kind of weird today. I, I don't want to suspect you of anything, but is something up? But in a little bit of a less sympathetic way, he's a little bit more, um, a little bit more vindictive in the book than he is in the movies. Yeah, you're playing like the Jude Law Karenin right now on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, he's he's more like, well, he's long winded and kind of jeering at her. Yeah, he's not. Don't think of him as the Jude Law. Don't. He's not a sympathetic character to the, nearly the same extent that he's in the movies in the books. My most complex PhD analysis of him, I would say, perhaps more more shadow than light. <laughs> 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 have i hit my quota for shadow and uh light quotes not like? yet not yet i'll tell you when you've hit it you're not allowed to know because that's part of shadow and light <laughs> that you never really know for certain i don't want someone from the bookstagram <laughs> community to come and smite me <laughs> <laughs> that's how you know you're truly done so yeah he's like i i know you're not having an affair right and she's like yes i am actually i'm i'm having an affair with with bronsky you know what? Now that you mention it, you've given me uh, you've given me a great opening. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. And to that, he basically says, "Well, maintain your propriety. We'll figure out something later." Not in a very menacing kind of way. It's not that bad of a deal. I'm just gonna say it. It's not. Yeah, it could could have gone worse. He was basically. He's like, "You can still live here and whatever. Um, just don't have Vronsky over to the house, which you know lasts about all of two days." <laughs> In the carriage is where we leave these two for now, and we go over to the the girls trip part of the, uh, part of this of this section of the book. Girls weekend. <laughs> the Scherbatskys trip to a spa in Germany. Now, initially, it's Kitty, her mother, the princess, and her father, the prince. 
Um, her father, the prince, really doesn't like Europe, so he dips pretty fast <laughs> to go travel <laughs> elsewhere. And Kitty hangs out. I, I, honestly, I don't have a good mark of how long they spend there, but it's it's a while they spend at this spa. I think it's a couple months, maybe. That's like a normal spa trip around this time, probably. It's pretty significant. Yeah. it's, it's She meets all kinds of people from all over the country. She even runs into Levin's brother, Nikolai, and Nikolai's wife, who uh, Levin finally convinced to go out of the country to a spa for his health. And, and she's, you know, still kind of, like, not really sure what's going on. She's done, she doesn't feel the same stresses of Moscow anymore, but now she's just... That's probably because she's just in kind of a weird situation trying to honestly alleviate a lot of her boredom. And and she part of that is alleviated by a, a another princess who comes to stay at the spa. A princess stall who happens to bring along a, a young girl with her, or teenager to young 20s, it's not really made clear. A girl who she comes to be, uh, find is named Varenka. Now Varenka is like an actual living saint. She's just great. She's always helping people. That's what she spends all her time doing. Everyone just enlists her to help them out. And Varenka is perhaps the best character in the book. And I'm going to lay it out right now. I think uh, is a better pairing for Kitty than Levin. But that's just me. Probably. <laughs> if we're if we're gonna go if we're gonna go ahead and and talk about if we must match up characters romantically, uh, the next couple of chapters are just Kitty and Varenka becoming having like a, a very charged <laughs> friendship where they just go around like kissing each other and talking about how great the other person is. And how, like, how good their morals are and how much they admire them. And when Varenka tells Kitty about, you know, I had a suitor, but his mother didn't like me, so he got married to another woman. And Kitty's like, well, if I was your suitor, I would never leave you behind. <laughs> I'm just saying. I could uh, alternate reality, but that's neither here nor there. I, di- I didn't notice how charged the friendship was on my first read, but that's a good, good point out. <laughs> mm. uh, but yeah, so... Kitty really likes Varenka's kind of morality, and she finds that that, that uh, Princess Stahl and Varenka are both very strongly Christian, which really drives a lot of their morality. And she starts really getting into that as well and trying to act more like Varenka. This does not come without problems. Uh, once Kitty's father returns, he kind of wanna makes fun of it because he actually knows something about this. He knows a bit more about Princess Stahl, and through Kitty's attempts to do good, she kind of starts helping this artist out, and she ends up causing a problem in his marriage because... Uh, He ends up taking a liking to her, and his wife, understandably, is not real cool at that, so that causes some domestic conflict there. Christian girls weekend. (laughs) (laughs) And Kitty's father tells her about Princess Stahl and her kind of morality, and she's like, oh, she's happy about everything God does, including her sickness, including the fact that her husband's dead. And Kitty's like, hmm, okay, well, that's taken a little (laughs) bit too far. Uh and at that point, she decides, like, we, I, I think I'm fine. I'm, I'm ready to head back to Moscow. And then she and Varenka have one last moment where she bids Varenka to come see her. And Varenka says, I'll come see you when you get married. And Kitty says, well, I'm never going to get married. And then Varenka's like, I'm never going to come see you then. And Kitty's like, well, then I'll get married just for you. I'm just saying it's a charged friendship. I think you've explained, actually, all of her uh, actions after this. I mean, that's, that's yeah. it. <laughs> that's the only reason that, yeah. And so Kitty heads back to Moscow, not not exactly feeling great, not perfectly fine, not regaining her former self, but she does feel serene. She feels calm now, and, and her original Moscow troubles had become but a memory to her. And that's part two. It's a pretty thick part. I, I really am enjoying this episode because I'm, you're going to have to come in with some actual analysis, and so far all I've contributed is <clears throat> my shipping ideas for this novel. I mean, that's as good as analysis. <laughs> I liked it. Yeah, I mean, okay, so we're still kind of in the in the section where, which is covered by most movies. Uh, you had a couple things that you really wanted to talk about, just right off the bat, which are, I mean, there's some pretty important scenes for what follows, for these characters really being set up for the, the trials to come. So there's a, a lot of scholarship on the horse race, which is a pretty intense scene in the movie and in the book. A, a lot of it is debatable as to how applicable it is Uh, i i would say uh perhaps 50 50 there's a lot of analysis comparing vronsky's relationship with his horse frufru to his relationship with anna uh we obviously haven't gotten to the rest of the vronsky anna relationship but if you are familiar even slightly with the plot you know what will happen and if you don't and you don't want to hear what happens next fair warning for this slight spoiler um it doesn't end well for Anna. And so there's a lot of analysis here as this being some sort of foreshadowing, basically Vronsky killing the horse uh, in a way that 
critics have said the storyline of him and Anna kind of mirrors this in the horse, but through a longer period of time. I think that that's probably not totally the case because I think that it's a little offensive to compare Anna to uh, a horse that Vronsky is riding in a race when Anna is really the one that's in control of a lot of the situations in the book. I don't know how you felt about the horse scene in general. I can see why you might want to pull a lot of symbolic value out of this, but it seems like it works to me a lot more, a, a great deal more as a mechanical feature of the plot than it does as something of thematic significance. Mm-hmm. It's a moment where they're kind of forced in a public setting to acknowledge each other. And Anna really has reveals the depth of her care for Vronsky unintentionally because she thinks he's dead. So she can't just, you know, you you would react pretty strongly if the person you loved you thought had just died in front of you. Just as a mechanical feature of the plot, it just makes sense why she reveals basically her affair to her husband. And I, don't, I, don't, I didn't pull a great deal of thematic significance out of this in particular. There's a lot of things I thought did have, but this was not, at least to me, one of them. Yeah, I think the line that a lot of people quote, or this one part from it is uh, where it says the clumsy movement made by Vronsky had broken her back, but that he only found that out much later. Um, Kind Mm. of this like unintentional, perhaps, hurting of horse slash Anna. I I kind of agree with you. I think when you're writing a 900-page book about aristocratic life, aristocrats only do like three things, and that's like eat, go to parties, and have affairs. So like you you need things that are not those. (laughs) Like, oh my God, there's so many times that she's over at Princess Betsy's house. Like, you know, you got to come up with other things that people are going to do throughout the novel. <laughs> so much of this novel is just finding new settings for these people to have conversations about their lives. <laughs> in. Yeah, I think a lot of the significance of Tolstoy's writing is in the not the things that are like really in your face, not the dead horse, not the giant blow arguments, but in the internal monologues that the characters tend to have. So, I'm, yeah, you know, I'm kind of with you on this. I don't really it, the horse scene. Like I said, it's been written about a lot, but it, for me, it's like not my favorite scene perhaps it's it's exciting like it's a fun moment but honestly before the horse scene we spend like a a couple chapters with Vronsky as he's just going through his morning and I pulled a lot more out of that than I did of the horse (laughs) scene because you have to throw some amount of speculation to any amount of like maybe the horse scene where Vronsky accidentally breaks its back is a metaphor it's much easier to look at Vronsky in his natural environment and just pull things out about his character in the way that he he receives a note from his mother from his brother and, and he just goes about his morning completely ignoring that note, feeling angry about it, and, and feeling driven forward by the fact that he feels distasteful about the fact that his family is mad. Not that he's having an affair, but that he's having an affair which is not societally advantageous. <laughs> and, and or the officers that he likes, or the officers that he has problems with, or just the fact that the whole morning, literally all the officer corps is doing is finding new ways to drink. That's all, I think, a lot more important just in terms of characterization. Because, I, I mean, I always tend to read Tolstoy as someone who's moralizing a little bit and I find a lot more just in the way he makes his characters act than I do in his uh, maybe you could say his subtle turns of phrase yeah well enough about poor Fru-Fru R.I.P. <laughs> R.I.P. the the other thing I, I wanted to talk about a little bit was the girls weekend it's I don't think ever been adapted into any of the films I think it gets a passing reference in Maybe the 67 adaptation. I feel like in one of them we watched, it got a little bit of a passing reference like, oh, Kitty, are you feeling better after being back from the spa? Um, like a little <laughs> bit of a plot point, uh, but they didn't have the budget yeah. or the time. <laughs> but I think it's, uh, I don't know if I think it's important enough to be adapted, but I think while you're reading it, it's worth another uh, a reread or a revisit personally. And what kind of strikes you most about it? So I think Tolstoy actually... <laughs> It's going to kind of hit you over the head with this several times as you're kind of going through this novel. This is the role that a lot of the, this kind of secondary-ish characters play, I think, is kind of where he moralizes through a lot of the ways. You, you would think it would come through Levin, but a lot of times, well, yes and no. Large scale throughout the whole plot, it does come through Levin, but you get these little kind of moralizing incidents. And this is when Tolstoy really had to had to stick it to the Christians real quick. Um, you know, he had to get, get a little <laughs> something in there because he couldn't quite, you know, just couldn't get enough in there. So uh, <laughs> one little jab, one little jab. Yeah. So I think this is the point where Kitty's trying to, to answer Tolstoy's main question, which is how do you live authentically? And I think that's why she's drawn to Princess or Madame Stahl is 
because she sees someone who seems like she's got it figured out and it seems like she's doing good in the world. It's only when her dad comes back and uh, <laughs> pulls back the mask, shows her that Madame Stahl's not really, she's not a saint. She she uses the wheelchair because she doesn't doesn't like her figure. Her legs are too short. Poor Varenka has to just kind of dote on her all day long. And, and Kitty realizes, wait a minute, this person doesn't have it figured out. This person's actually really selfish. And so there's this kind of Tolstoyan thing that he does in a lot of his books in stories where he doesn't like the idea of totalizing moral systems like Christianity, for instance. He doesn't want anything that's going to come in with a set of rules and say, do this, this, and this, and you'll have a happy life. That's, you know, anytime you see somebody do that in any of his stories, you know that they're going to go wrong somewhere down <laughs> down the road, down the line. And I think that's that's what he does at first to illustrate with Kitty here. And Levin does this like multiple times throughout the book. Uh, every time you think he's got it figured out, he <laughs> doesn't actually have it figured out. Tolstoy does this like a ton in War and Peace and a lot of his other uh, stories as well. So it's it's not really very exciting, but I think it's important. <laughs> it is. That's where kind of the meat and bones of Anna Karenina is not in the exciting <laughs> moments. Although we do love the exciting moments, but very much in the quiet moments of understanding, I guess, in the kind of in-betweens almost of between understanding and because you never really get to understanding in Tolstoy's books. It's a lot of people trying to figure things yeah. out, going back and forth and evolving on their views all the time. Yeah, I think, well, I think that's kind of what his point is. Uh, people may disagree with me. Maybe I, they don't like my understanding of Tolstoy. But I think the the point is that we all intrinsically know what is right and wrong. That's why Kitty can discern. That's why she has this like internal ethical detector or clock when she sees certain people where she's like, oh, no, that's not really what I want to do uh, or you know, this is why I'm drawn to Varenka, but ultimately not to Madame Stahl. But it's not it's not explicitly stated really until the end. And then you're kind of hitting yourself on the forehead and you're like, why did I read 900 pages about Levin when he's just going to be like, <laughs> hey, I'll just live how I want. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler. <laughs> oh, no, I've spoiled the ending. You've spoiled Levin's intellectual progress process whatever what everyone comes to this book for don't worry we can painstakingly cover each individual turn in the future episodes <laughs> <laughs> well speaking of turns in his philosophy i did actually want to talk about his discussion with steva about the aristocracy yeah. talk about it hit me with it when steva comes to sell his forest to Ryabedin, he kind of is discussing with levin and levin says basically you're getting ripped off you, you did you even count the trees in the forest and steve was like why would i count the trees in the forest <laughs> levin says well how are you going to determine the value of the forest if you don't know what you're selling steve says to him well that's what all the prospectors were offering to me this is really the best deal of all and and levin tells him no all the prospectors are working with the they all undersell so Ryabinin can can be slightly higher than them and seem like you're getting a great deal when you're still getting really ripped off if you talk to someone here, you would know what was going on. You, you city folk like to learn a few terms about the countryside and think that that means you know what's going on here when you really don't. And, and Steve was like, oh, why do you even care? Levin to this says, but you know, because I'm an aristocrat and I feel some something in my blood which makes me better than, you know, the prospectors around here, kind of. But I consider myself aristocratic, and people like me who can point back in the past to three or four honorable generations of their family of the highest degree of breeding, talent and intellect, of course, that's another matter, and I have never curried favor with anyone, never depended on anyone for anything, like my father and grandfather, and I know many such. You think it despicable of me to count the trees in my forest while you make Ryabinin a present of 30,000, but you get rents from your lands and I don't know what. Well, I don't, and so I prize what's come to me from my ancestors, or been won by hard work. We are aristocrats, and not those who can only exist by the favor of the powerful of the world, and who can be bought for 20 kopecks. Bold words for a man who can only exist at the pleasure of the czar, but okay. Uh, <laughs> so why did, why did you pick out this passage? <laughs> Up to this point, I mean, it seems out of character for Levin, if you were following up to this point. I don't think it is. I think it's really just a further elaboration on his ideas, which we're going to continue on and on. Sure. But his, his ideas on what makes an aristocrat are, are really interesting to me, because he's kind of creating two classes here. And, and that he has, he says Vronsky isn't an aristocrat earlier because his father crawled up from nothing. So he's kind of setting up the, the idea of an aristocracy means family history. It means that you can't just become an aristocrat. If you get it from, you know, your title 
or whatever. You're not really an aristocrat. You're your new money, essentially. That's basically what it is. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and, and he's like, yeah, I never I never accepted any handouts again. Bold words from man who inherited everything he owns from his parents, but I feel like I, I don't think Tolstoy's self aware to realize what he's doing here. Because I think he feels he's like, Yeah, yeah, I'm living. I'm gonna write in this dialogue. Yeah. And then but also Tolstoy came from an extremely, extremely wealthy aristocratic family as well. Yeah, well I was, I was gonna ask you about that because I was trying to figure out is this a moment which Tolstoy is setting up Levin to be knocked down later, or is this just Tolstoy not being super self aware about him trying to be like you know, actually, I'm a good kind of aristocrat because I worked with what I, I worked the land, unlike those other ones who are, you know, bought and sold so they can live the high lives. Maybe a little bit of a little bit of both. Um, I can go on my rants about Russian family titles if you want. Please do. So <laughs> this is one of the fun things you get to learn about in Ph.D. school is how titles were handed down in Imperial Russia. Ooh. Um, oh yeah it's pretty spicy i would say so it actually was actually kind of interesting as i was learning about this um in russia when you had kids they would all get title so in western europe usually only your eldest would and it would uh property would transfer through the eldest son generally not not the case so much in russia so the property is going to be divided between all of your little suckers that you have uh, as kids and your giant nice estate is slowly going to be squandered away over generations uh, if you have a lot of kids uh even women get you know titles and can actually hold property so that's a really big difference between countries and so levin's talking about being able to draw this line three or four generations back which first of all i just note was a thing for tolstoy as well he was absolutely obsessed with proving his like pure ancestral line (laughs) is a lot Uh, he was he was like (laughs) he would have been like the spokesman of (laughs) Ancestry.com. <laughs> but like one that gave you kind of weird vibes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the ones where you're like, are you sure this is right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so Levin is clearly, he is that kind of old Moscow aristocrat. And Steva is not. He's like, like you said, he's he's new money. He's either, he's either from an aristocratic family where all the estates have been squandered, which based on his spending habits, I mean, look at it. It's clearly that could have happened. Uh, or he is, I, I think that's more likely what it is. He wasn't, I don't think, part of this kind of new merchant class, which is pseudo aristocratic, I guess. It's not usually titled, but they have money uh, starting to arise at this point. He does things that that merchant class does, like sell land. And that's a Levin thing and a Tolstoy thing that, that they don't like. Uh, to Levin, the old aristocrats have some sort of tie with the land. They physically work their own land. Uh, even though he has a ridiculous amount of serfs that are doing it in actuality, uh, um, he <laughs> he feels that sort of connection to it. Whereas Steva is fine buying, selling. It doesn't really matter. He just sees dollar signs, uh, and he's not even good at it either. So I, to answer your question, I, I would say it's probably more Tolstoy being not that self-aware uh, as opposed to Levin. Well, because, you know, I don't know if Levin cares less later about the aristocracy, but he certainly loves to just stroke his own ego about working his own land kind of kind of i at one point he complains that he you know he hires bailiffs in order to enforce his his will and he kind of says that's what i hate about the bailiffs no matter what i tell them they always kind of have this you know well if god wills it kind of attitude and they just throw up their hands and i feel like that was just Tolstoy complaining about his own <laughs> bailiffs um like there are ways around that problem, but maybe that's just uh maybe that's just i've been i've been working in hr for too long and by too long i mean like half a year to that now staffing concerns are in the back of my mind so i'm like well, here's how you could get around that tolstoy <laughs> now first of all tolstoy you've got to incorporate an hr department on your in your serfs well surely he didn't think about that but had you been there as an <laughs> hr consultant for his estate Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> first of all hire better bailiffs that's my first advice <laughs> <laughs> no, i think he's kind of paralleling Russia's issues with modernizing their farming industry and just industry and workforce in general. This is another thing for Tolstoy is like you could buy the most expensive machinery, which he does, and put it on your land and hire new people who are good at working. And it just doesn't happen. Like, you know, maybe they don't know how to use the machines. Maybe they think that their way is best. It's just it's a it's a people problem. It's not a an economic issue necessarily 
Uh, and I think that that's kind of like an interesting subplot of the farming subplots in the story. Our favorite plots about the adultery story, the farming subplots. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking for basically 19th century Russian farming simulator. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, come to Anna Karenina. We've got adultery, farming simulators, <laughs> girls weekend at the spa, but it lasts for several months. <laughs> yeah. Um, I also wanted to point out when Steva first arrives, he and Levin are talking and Steva says to him, Levin asks him how how he's doing and, and Steva responds, you don't agree. I know that one can be fond of fresh rolls when one has had one's rations of bread. To your mind, it's a crime, but I don't count life as life without love. So we're still on the roll thing. Yeah. Probably the better part of a year later, which I think reinforces our earlier point that Steva should not be allowed in bakeries. No, absolutely not. I just feel like he was thinking, like he was definitely thinking about this for a while. He was like, you know what? I'm coming to Levin's estate and I'm bringing this zinger with me. And boy, does he deliver. Boy, boy, does he deliver about his defense of out of nowhere defense of his adultery. Yeah, well, I actually do think it's the opposite of what I just said, because I think that this is how Steve is where because he only really has the ability to live moment to moment. So I think when he sees Levin, it re-springs in his mind the conversation that they had just had so for the reader it actually feels like no time has passed between when you had last seen the two but actually it's been a significant amount of time that's passed but for both the reader and for steva it's as if no time has really passed yeah perhaps that's even just as well shown as when he sees vronsky later on and of course his his sister-in-law is in another country recuperating because Vronsky has treated her so badly. <laughs> and he claps him on the back and is like, hey, when am I gonna when are we gonna hang out next? <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, it's like when you see someone you hate and then your friends are still liking their photos, even though you knew know they hate him hate I'm not saying not that I'm talking about anyone in particular, but uh <laughs> But perhaps. Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> um yeah, did anything else in particular kind of strike you about this section? I mean, this is a pretty thick section, I gotta say. This is... Yeah, it is. Perhaps for when we get going on our book club in our Discord, uh, we could talk a little bit more with all of our wonderful friends, which, yes, yes you, dear listener, could be one of those in our Discord as well. <laughs> I think I, my favorite part of the book club will be when I'm going to see if I can go back through and mark down every time they say the phrase, what is to be done? What? <laughs> and that's going to be my contribution. What is to be done? <laughs> Great question. If only Leo Tolstoy had another book answering that question. Oh my God, wait a minute. I, do, I think he does. I think he does. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> is there another episode our listeners could go to to answer that question? <laughs> I really wouldn't recommend it, but you can. <laughs> <laughs> You can. It's uh, well. It's more interesting than Chernyshevsky's mate. Well, no, Chernyshevsky's has the ultimate, the peak of masculinity, uh, the absolute of, uh, unit of ideal male function. Mm -hmm. So you you take that back right now. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> I guess with that we kind of wrap up part two, which is pretty exciting. Yes, I'm super excited to move on to part three. But before that, we've got a couple other things. Uh, first of all, we cannot forget the tradition. On a scale of one to Yeltsin, Matt, how drunk are you? I'm only probably like, I say three or four. You know, I'm on the boys' trip, but I'm fine-tuned so I can mm -hmm. continue hunting. Uh, not that I hunt, but, you know, boys' trip. Yeah, I was going to ask you about questions. I was going to give you a question about drinking and, and, and hunting at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe that makes it better. I don't know. I'm not a hunter. Uh, yeah, me either. And I, I don't own land, so I don't really, you know, I can't relate to very much in this book. Yeah, I, well, it's been a long time since I've shot a rifle, but can, I can only presume that drunkenness would improve my aim. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, what about you? How did you end up? Uh, I'm probably about a two because the, the beer I bought, they only sold in singles and each one was mm. $6 each. Ooh, so I just boy. bought one. Yeah, I don't blame you on that. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. But it was, it was a good beer, so I don't regret it. All right. Well, to switch into something uh, completely different, what are we reading next week, Matt? Well, next week we're getting back out here for all the Soviet lit boys, and actually modern lit boys. Uh, next week we're going to be reading the Nobel Prize winning The Unwomanly Face of War by Svetlana Alexeyevich. Uh, we're going to be reading kind of selections from it for those who are not familiar. It's very fragmentary in nature. So we'll be discussing the book as a whole. We'll be talking about Alexeyevich, who's a really important writer uh, in Russia. Uh, of course and 
you know, it's going to be, I would like to say fun, but it's going to be a little bit sad. <laughs> Actually, a lot of bit sad. I mean, that's par for the course for us. Yeah. Honestly, the, the series that we've been doing on Adultery is probably the, like the like the happiest series of episodes we've done this whole time. Yeah. It's, <laughs> the, the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no follow up. Just no. Nope, yeah. Just yeah. Yeah. Well, before we let you go, we want to extend a sincere thank you to all of our current patrons. Jeff, Janice, Anne, Emily, Jesse, Madeline, Alex, Daniel, Irini, Paige, Darren, Larkin, Lou, Gary, Daniel, Jack, Alex, and Roland. Podcasting isn't free, and grad school doesn't pay very well, so if you're interested in joining with our current patrons to keep the show running, take a look at our Patreon at patreon.com slash tipsytolstoy. The music used in this episode was Soviet March by Toasted Tomatoes. You can find more of their stuff on toastedtomatoes.bandcamp.com and also on YouTube under the same username. If you're looking for other places to find us, you can also follow us on Instagram at Tipsy Tolstoy Podcast or join our email list on our website, tipsytolstoy.com. You'll hear from us again soon.